and other fluids except yeah. alcohol. <laughs> yeah, which is for our particular in our particular culture can be can be can be troublesome. Um, yeah, yeah, and you know what? I'm human. I drink alcohol, um, but I think the main point is that people understand the risks associated it, with it, mm -hmm. and so therefore you're making an informed decision. I think it would be very unfair for people to continue drinking alcohol and not realize that it's one of the big risk factors for developing dementia. So uh, I think it's only fair that people are informed. I also think for a developing teen brain, um, uh, we need to, we tend to see it as a rite of passage for teenage years in, in Ireland. Mm. Uh, I would have engaged just as a lot of teens my generation did in alcohol and dabbled probably in drugs as well. Um, and that's way before I knew that a teenage brain is completely different to an adult brain and their response to alcohol and drugs is completely different mm. uh, to an adult brain, making them very vulnerable to addiction. Um, I want to. You, you touched on something there. There's a fantastic card and a fascinating card in the book about stress and chronic stress, um, where you talk about reflexive versus reflective thinking, and yeah. you say when we become chronically stressed, our reflexive brain inappropriately overrides our reflective brain, and we begin to see threat where there is none. Now that sounds to me like we're building in some kind of trauma response or PTSD, um, if and and. Can you can you expand on that? You also say that stress can harm the CNS, the central nervous system, as well, which is deeply concerning. Well, the brain is part. Yeah, yeah. So look, I, I I do want to start by saying there's nothing wrong with stress per se. The stress response evolved because it serves a purpose. Mm. Uh, the issue is when it becomes poorly managed and chronic, mm. or when you actually have the reverse, which is insufficient stress. So just to explain why and when stress is good, um, uh, and I'm talking about the stress response. Unfortunately, the word stress is used to uh, describe the feeling, the thing that stresses you, and the stress response. So it kind of gets confusing to talk about it. So I'm mm. talking about the physiological stress response which releases cortisol and, and adrenaline. And obviously there's the first instance, you know, well, it can help you fight or flee, whatever in that moment, but it also helps you rise to the challenges and cope with novelty and learning the things that I'm saying are good for your brain in terms of har harnessing neuroplasticity. Mm. So, you know, stress helps us to attain our goals. You know, uh, if you didn't go on that first date, which is very stressful, you may never find the love of your life. If you don't apply for that job interview, which is stressful, you don't progress. Do you know what I mean? And mm. but the thing is, it's, 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 it's very individual. So it's about finding your own stress sweet spot, you know, and, and it is very important to just keep pushing yourself beyond your comfort zone because in doing that, you build resilience, it's the adaptability. So as you gradually do it, the thing is to do it in sort of a healthful way. Now you're, you were referring then to maladaptive, you know, responses to stress. That's really important also in childhood, uh, you know, um, going right back to being a baby, you know, attachment styles, et cetera. If a baby wasn't attended to quickly or properly, they may develop, develop uh, a maladaptive stress response. In other words, they may become hyper stressed too soon um, or not stressed at all when they should be. So mm. it's kind of maladaptive. So basically the way it works in a normal instance is the information from your environment um, and actually also internal information, you know, feelings in your stomach or whatever. But let's just take the external environment because it just makes for the easiest illustration. So you hear a loud noise, you're walking along the street, you hear a loud noise. Um, the information about that noise, that signal goes to your amygdala, which is an unconscious part of your brain that handles fear and emotions. Now that information goes to your amygdala via two routes. One route is very fast, unconscious, immediate and reflexive. Mm. So it comes in, noise, jump, <laughs> you know, literally jump out of the way or cower down or, or whatever. You, you have no thought involved, literally just happens. Then the second route, the information goes um, to through your frontal lobes, mm. which are the most well-connected part of your brain and involved in um, 
uh, so many activities, what we call that sort of higher order activities um, and controlling our behavior and our impulses and planning and decisions and or, or organization, etc. But the point about them is they're so well connected that when that information comes in, they have access to all the other information the context because mm. really that's what's key here is the context you know well hold on what is the context of that noise and if that context of that noise is ah it was a car backfiring right your brain has that that frontal lobes have the capacity to send a message to say switch off the stress response that was initially activated in the first instance. You can almost feel it going into your fingertips, you know, mm. uh, you know, the stress hormones are released and uh, um, various other things happen, which I'll talk about in a moment. So it can send that message and say, switch it off. Uh, and so the feedback loop is closed and the stress response is switched off and your body goes back into what's called rest and digest mode. Now, or else your brain can look and say, oh, bloody hell, there's a gunman and a shot has just been fired. Right. Let's ramp up the stress response. We shut down things like digestion that are not necessary. The immune response is, 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 is suppressed. Uh, extra oxygen is pumped to your brain and extra you know, energy and glucose pumped to your muscles so you can fight or flee. And you kind of hear of people, you know, lifting things are moving cars off kids yeah, yeah. Well, buses something. off babies you know yeah 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 that kind of thing but uh, i don't know how far that goes but it does definitely happen now what seems to happen with poorly managed chronic stress is that feedback loop gets broken mm. and the stress response is not switched off so the stress hormones are continually being released and in that instance, what happens is that neuroplasticity that we were talking about becomes suppressed in your frontal lobes. And so to put it very grossly, sort of, that means your frontal lobes start to shrink, in mm. essence. Mm. And uh, unfortunately, neuroplasticity then is enhanced in your amygdala. And so your amygdala becomes stronger. And mm. so what happens is instead of your frontal lobes overriding your amygdala, the reverse starts to occur. Your your amygdala starts to override, and you, you know your your the second slow response is reflective. It's conscious. Uh, it's slow. It's thinking, and when that's pushed out of the way, everything becomes uh, and you know an immediate unconscious, unthinking, reflexive, emotional response. And when your your brain is literally on high alert, mm. so you know, um, you know, if if someone makes a loud, say say you're watching a movie, and it's a scary movie, and you're like, you know, you're it, that's kind of a form of stress release, but it, it's kind of an exciting form of it, you know. And you're watching the movie, and you go to, and then someone comes in and bangs the door, and you go, oh jeez, mm. <laughs> you know, like you're you hyper respond to things. So I suppose that's kind of a simple way to explain what happens is, you know, you're on this high, high alert um, all the time and you can't think clearly. Um, and, and so brain fog sort of enters the equation and inability to focus and concentrate and think clearly and inability to solve problems, um, irritability, they all then can have a knock on effect on your job and on your relationships, causing more stress. Mm -hmm. And then there's this inextricable relationship between sleep and stress, because you need to go into a deep sleep uh, for certain chemicals to be released that actually uh uh, dissipate cortisol so if, if you're stressed your br brain is going round and round your thinking is you know like you're, you're having trouble sleeping you're not actually even clearing the cortisol so it's this whole feedback loop you know the less sleep you get the more stressed you become the more stressed you become the less sleep you get and uh, it just really has a knock-on effect so um it's really 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 critical for us to learn how to manage um, our stress and of course as I, I did mention you know too little stress is not good because mm -hmm. your brain can't afford to waste um precious resources on brain cells that aren't being used and so um it will pick them off prune them out and so your brain will shrink um, as a regard so so yeah it's important to make sure um you have enough stress and that's very personal you know
And there's a kind of, an, <clears throat> pardon me, another a side topic, a relational topic here about that, that you bring up in the brain, Jim, and you talk about control in our emotional states. Okay. Right. And I found remind, this. Remind me what I said. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the feeling of autonomy um, and the lack of control. I was thinking about this in terms of the work that we do and the kind of hierarchies that we exist within in society. The less and less control a person has, say, for example, in, in their job or their work that they do, that, that lack of feeling of control can affect somebody's emotional state. Um, and I thought it was... Yeah. 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 You thought it was... I thought it was very, very important for people to understand both the reflexive thinking yeah. and the lack of control, right? So... And I, I felt that there is some kind of relational thing there. And I, I was thinking about it in terms of the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. We all encounter people who can be very reflexive. Yeah. And you've just given us really the, the scientific, neuroscientific understanding of this person might actually have experienced developmental stress or it, this yeah. may have been ingrained over time. And I, I think that's very interesting. And I think also what's very interesting, if we can work on the reflective part yeah if we can yeah. do that um and, but... and the, the control piece you raised is important uh, i mean actually we the sort of psychological term is about where you place your locus of control and again mm. it's using an unnecessarily kind of complex complex or rare word i i because that's i in a way what i try to specialize in is just let's talk about this in plain english you know and, and make it as understandable as possible as possible but we all have sort of have tendencies towards certain um behaviors or whatever so some people have a tendency to put control uh in the power of others you know what how they perceive control um they sort of say well you know that every pretty much most things are beyond their control they believe that things happen to them mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and and people who uh, attribute uh control to others or to things like luck or fate or mm -hmm. chance and um, they're actually much more prone to anxiety because I do think that's an interesting thing. I mean, my dad uh, lived with severe anxiety and I, I remember talking to him and I'm saying, ah, oh, that's the first time he said it's ever made sense because tend, people tend to think anxiety is about worrying unnecessarily. Mm. And, and, and that can happen. But in a lot of instances, anxiety is about feeling you have no control. Uh, and that's a scary feeling, you know, um, that you can can't control things happening. Um, uh, and and, and uh, an example where I say personally say would get anxious is, and I'll, I'm sure a lot of people would, um, kind of have experienced this is, you know, if somebody hasn't come home, and we nowadays have phones, and you keep ringing their phone and it's ringing out, mm. you know, your anxiety bills oh my god oh my god why aren't they answering the phone and it's it, it, it's the control you can't get them you can't speak to them to check that they're okay you know um but uh yeah then people who place control within themselves and you can kind of call that responsibility in a way mm. they those people feel they're in the driving seat um and they they feel responsible they, they you know obviously there's things in the world happen that we have absolutely no control over but a lot of the things it's about how we perceive the event and whether you know we can do something about it or whether we uh something we did impacted or led to that um that particular situation but the the point really is that people who believe they are in control and in the driving seat actually tend to be happier and less stressed that's a short clip for the full episode. Click right about down here. And for the subscribe button, that should be over here. Thank you so much to everybody who has subscribed so far. I appreciate each and every one of you. Have a fantastic Christmas, a happy new year, and I shall see you all in January. Thank you. Mm -hmm.